Can you guys see that? Somebody give me a thumbs up. Awesome. Okay, great. Whew, man, it's been a crazy day. I hope you guys are having fun. This has been fantastic. I tell you, this year has gone much better than I expected. Uh, everything's been so smooth and uh, I've really enjoyed the back and forth in Slack. So I hope you guys are enjoying it too. Um, this talk is a little different than most of the talks. I normally give more like a technical top. Uh, this is more of a, a kind of a social, um, uh, I don't know, social uh, acknowledgement of what's going on. Uh, the idea of this talk, privacy as a service, uh, I've, I've had a lot of discussions with people over the last uh, six months to a year about things that are affecting privacy. And I don't feel like people really understand the scope of modern technology and the potential that it's going to have on privacy. Um, and I realized I can't view Slack from here. Hold on. I'm going to try to see if I can pull Slack up and monitor the tr track while I give the talk. This is going to fail miserably, I'm sure, but we'll see what happens. All right. So the goal of this talk, I want to talk about some technology that's happening and the way that technology is going to play together and what I see happening in the very near future. Uh, I'm not talking about like right now, like, hey, this is really, really bad, like right this second. Um, and I'm not talking about like, hey, this could happen eventually 15 in the years in the future. What I'm talking about is in the near future, say five to 10 years, maybe 15, uh, the ramifications of current events, current technology, and where we sit. Um, so um, a couple of things. One, this is not a tinfoil hat talk. This is not like a, oh my gosh, run for the hills. Uh, this is not a, a uh, Jimmy James talk, uh, you know, go create a compound and, and live, with, live with the rabbits and the goats and, and what might, whatever it might be. Um, my goal is not, my goal is not to create fear. Uh, my goal is for all of us to come into things with our eyes wide open. Um, so in my opinion, the future is going to happen whether we like it or not. You, you have one way for your future to not happen. I don't want that to happen to anybody, but we need to be prepared for what's gonna happen. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. That's all about me. You all, I've been around long enough, people probably know who I am. If not, if you Google Nathan Swaney, I'm the only one in the world, so you can find out everything you wanna know about me. Um, lots of information there. I love this uh, picture. This is one of my favorite pictures. I just have to share that. I was, I was speaking at a conference in the Bahamas back in January. And I look up from eating lunch and, and or dinner or something. And there's a sign right there that says no hacking. And uh, my wife is like, did they know you were coming? Uh, so I had to go get a selfie. And then this, this like tourist police guy was over there and he, and he was wanting to know what I was doing, what was going on. Apparently in the Bahamas, hacking is what they call uh, people that pretend to be a taxi, but they're not really licensed. They call it hacking, which somebody said maybe goes back to like hackney. I don't know, some British term or whatever. Uh, anyway. Enough about that. Let's move on. I don't have a lot of time. So privacy is dead. I know, I know. People have been saying this forever. Privacy is dead. Privacy is dead. Whatever. Uh, I've got a lot of memes and a lot of pictures, by the way. I try to have fun. Um, there's lots and lots of examples of this. Uh, just a few days ago, I was talking with my boss, Kevin, about the story. Man, it's probably been 10 years ago now. Um, and I think we've all heard it when Target sent um, advertisements for pregnancy related items to a teenage girl and the dad got all upset and threw a fit and and you know called target and, and and made a big deal about it you know how dare you glorify teenage pregnancy and 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 how dare you do all this stuff we'll come to find out the girl was pregnant it's not clear whether she knew or he knew or they didn't know or whatnot but the idea was that target knew because of the things that she was buying, her purchase history and the things that she was looking at. Now, back then, I don't think it was necessarily a machine learning type, al type algorithm. Today, we would look at that and we'd be like, oh yeah, machine learning. They just, they correlated, they figured out this thing and, and they sent it to them. Um, most likely back then, it was probably somebody just doing data analytics and, and data mining and saying, okay, everybody that buys these items also tends to buy these items, you know, or, or tends to be going through this demographic or this stage of life, so let's send them advertisements for that. Um, but that, that concept, we've all been exposed to that. Um, every, almost every day we hear somebody say, oh, you know, I was talking to my significant other the other day about buying a boat. And then all of a sudden Facebook starts showing me ads for buying a boat. And clearly they're listening to everything I say. You know, it, you forget about the fact that you drove past a boat dealership and you parked and you looked at boats for three hours the other day or whatever, you know. Uh, people are collecting logs about us. They're collecting details and they're using that to market it to us because it's profitable. That's how capitalism works. That's how, um, that's how technology works. Aaron's sneaking up behind me. I don't know what he's going to do, but I'm, I'm kind of concerned about it. <laughs> My privacy is being violated here. Um, but you know, I mentioned Facebook, Facebook, everybody's just giving out tons of details. I'm, I'm, uh, possibly one of the worst ones. Somebody challenged me one time. I travel a fair amount. Somebody said, 
you know, are you really comfortable talking about where you're traveling and being gone on Facebook? Like anybody can see that. Like, aren't you worried about your family? But, well, no, my wife knows how to shoot a shotgun. <laughs> I'm not any more worried about it than if I were home. Um, but, you know, there, there are technologies we've put in place. There are things we've tried to do to try to maintain or regain some semblance of, a, of, of privacy. Uh, you know, uh, uh, incognito mode in your browser, uh, Chrome, as, as some of my coworkers uh, call it porn mode. They didn't even know it was called incognito mode for a long time. Uh, the, the tour, <laughs> the, uh, a tour that allows you to, to browse anonymously, uh, supposedly. Um, but there's still tons of tracking stuff. And then, you know, we have things like Firefox DNS that, you know, they, they, they have good intentions and the goal of, of um, maintaining privacy and stuff like that. Um, and we're fighting back. There are things that are going on. Uh, Luke Crouch and I have had, had lots of conversations back and forth. And I always enjoy kind of debating back and forth with him about, you know, the impact of certain technologies on privacy and what we need to do just to stand up. And, and he's taken a very active stance about we have to be proactive. We have to be intentional. We have to do stuff now today about it. Um, and I'm not going to get too much into that because, you know, like I think he does a great job of, of ringing that bell. I'm just uh, talking about some specific things uh, I'm going to talk about some specific things here in a minute. How about that? So very briefly, what is privacy? Um, the problem, if, if you can throw an answer in chat, if you're listening, if you're paying attention, I'd love to hear a succinct answer to what you think privacy is. Uh, unfortunately, there's like a four second delay between the time I ask that question and the time you guys actually hear it. And then you have to take the time to type. And for all I know, you guys have all left and are watching one of the other tracks, which I probably wouldn't blame you. There's some pretty good speakers I'm up against. So I'm curious if anybody, if you were going to define privacy, what does it mean to you? Why is it important? Or do you care? Maybe everybody's already given up already. Any thoughts on that? I'm waiting. <laughs> I love Slack when it says several people are typing, right? I picture the incoming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, from Lord of the Rings, the dude setting up uh, privacy in the web in real life. Yes. What is the definition of privacy? Okay. Say on, I, I'm assuming I'm saying that right. Say on uh, says she has different definitions for privacy in the web versus in real life. That's interesting. Bill data under my control. I love that. That's a pretty good definition actually. Maintaining control over your personal information. Again, that the concept of control. Uh, O'Shawn, the ability to determine and change who has access to what information. Okay to determine and change. I would maybe add the ability to know who can use that information, uh, who has access to it. Uh, my not public actions while not being public. Okay, Stephen, that's, that's pretty good. Yes, maintain control. So here's what, uh, here's what Wikipedia says. The ability of an individual or group to seclude themselves or information about themselves and thereby express themselves selectively. So it does come back to sort of a control thing. Obviously, Wikipedia is not the ultimate source, um, but it, we have that idea of controlling what, what is known about us and how it's being used and, and whatnot. Um, our society has always valued privacy. Maybe not always, but for a pretty significant period. The, the Western Judeo-Christian culture that we've grown up in uh, has valued privacy uh, significantly more than other cultures. If you look at, at uh, other parts of the world, that's something that has been fairly unique to Western culture, Western society. Um, we have this value of privacy. But wait, we're Americans, right? Privacy is a constitutional right. I, I have a right to privacy. People, people say that all the time. Well, not really. Um, it's actually not a right. Uh, there, there's some legal precedents, precedences, however you say that, not precedents, precedents around privacy. Um, generally, those have been argued in the Supreme Court around the First Amendment, the Third, the Fifth, the Ninth, the Fourteenth. All of these different amendments have some legal concept that if I don't have the privacy to exercise this, then I really don't have this right. So the Supreme Court has kind of agreed that there's an inherent right to privacy within um, but not necessarily a defined right to privacy. Um, I would kind of argue maybe it's the autonomy to choose whether or not to engage in certain acts or experiences. Um, so in addition to control, you have some freedom to, to exercise that control in a way. Um, let's move on. Ba, 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 ba. All right, so privacy is not really dead. Um, you know, mostly dead. No, not quite. Not really. No, it is. Here's the thing. I'm not going to make a legal argument. I'm not going to talk about whether you should have the right or you shouldn't have the right. I totally am on the forefront of privacy is important. Like that is something that we should maintain. It's something we should hold on to. But technology is challenging that uh, significantly. 
Um, we're not going to debate the social ideals of whether it's ideal or not. Privacy is dead because technology has killed it. That sounds like a, a strong argument, but that's what I'm going to try over the next 35 minutes or so. I'm going to try to present that to you and, and see where I'm coming from. And I hope to, to really draw some, uh, some, some controversy or, or some debate. Austin earlier said he was going to listen to my talk and, and throw tomatoes at me or something. I don't know. So we'll see what happens there. Um, honestly, I hope this talk kind of scares the crap out of you. I hope you sit back and say, wow, I never thought about that. Yeah, that's a big deal. You know, Jimmy James over living in a compound somewhere with his bunny rabbits and his goats. Maybe it's not such a bad idea. Maybe I need to, to step off the grid. Um, I love this quote from William Gibson. The future has arrived. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Um, you know, the, if you went back 10 years and you tried to explain what we're doing right here today, this would be insane. Uh, I saw a picture the other day of somebody using a cell phone to take a selfie with a mask on. And they're like, that would not have made any sense 10 or 15 years ago. Like nobody would have known what the phone was. They wouldn't have known what a selfie was. They wouldn't have known why you were wearing a mask. Like all those things didn't make sense. The iPhone came out in 2006, 2007, something like that. So it's a little bit more than 10 years. Um, but the, uh, what I'm talking about is not necessarily future tech. It's not long distance out in the future. It's, it's what's here today. I want to talk about some, some technology that's happening today. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is a fantastic article about a gentleman who hacked his Tesla. This was at uh, DEF CON 2017, I'm sorry, DEF CON 2019. It was DEF CON 27. This man's name is Truman Kane. This was last year. Um, he gave a talk about how he uh, basically hacked his Tesla, um, took out the middle console and built a computer into it that he could control uh, and gained access to the um, camera feeds from the cameras. And I don't remember the exact number. I think, I think uh, a, a new Tesla has like 12 cameras around it as well as other technologies. Um, but because of the way he did this, he was able to grab those feeds and had a 360 degree view of his car at all the time, at all times. Now he did that using basically just open source software is my understanding. He was able to detect and store license plates and faces. He used open source software to detect license plates and faces around him. And his goal, I can't remember what he called it. He called it the, um, oh, it's in the link, the surveillance detection scout. His idea was, his goal was, if you set this up in your car, you can determine whether or not somebody is following you. Because in general, you might see a license plate near your car, right? Once in a while, you might pass somebody at the grocery store or you might see the car trailing you or in front of you. Occasionally, you might see the same car a couple times. But unless you work with them or unless you live close to them, it's unlikely that you're going to see it often. And so what his software did was it used this open source uh, tooling to identify license plates and faces of people to tell, hey, this person has been around you a lot. They're obviously following you. Something's going on. Now, here's the thing. This is this is, let me take it to the next step. Imagine, if you will, how long will it be until every car in the country has a dozen cameras all the way around it, 360 degree view, recording everything? Now, as far as I know, I don't know for sure. As far as I know, the, the uh, systems in the Tesla do not store recordings of all of that data. It would be a, a pretty significant amount of data. So I, I would imagine they're not storing it locally. I don't think there's the bandwidth or they're, they're set up to be able to, to, to uh, send that anywhere yet. Uh, I think that would probably be in the news and people would be talking about that. But how long will it be until every car is like that and has that data? Potentially having the ability to track every face, every car, who goes when, with, with, with who, for how long, where they're, what they're doing, where they're going, all of those interactions. Then take it the next step. It's not just the cameras. Those cars also have LIDAR and radar to be able to, to detect little kids running across and you know, to, to do the, uh, the self-driving and all that kind of stuff. Um, they're able to detect, potentially, if you have the right processing, the ability to detect, hey, not only can I recognize this face, I can recognize the gait of this particular person, the way they walk, the, the little hitch in their hip when they walk. And so I can begin to identify certain people based on who they are. But wait, they also have Wi-Fi, they have Bluetooth, they have all these technologies that are not only able to, to be connected to, but they're also able to monitor for uh, the MAC addresses of Wi-Fi signals, of Bluetooth MAC addresses. So any device that walks past one of these vehicles could very easily be able to grab all of that data and do something with it. 
And it's not just cars, right? How many people have, uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to say it, I don't think there's any around here, Alexa. Uh, you know, I have to be careful in my office because I actually have a one in my office at home. Um, you know, that little box has the potential to be able to capture a lot of information. You know, the ring doorbells, all the security systems that are going on in there. I think there are more security cameras in my neighborhood now, definitely way more than there were just a few years ago, but there's almost more now than there's not. You know, different houses have them than, than didn't. All of that data has the potential to be collected and be utilized. Uh, catching up on Sack here, someone said, USAA tried to block access to a crash Tesla they had impounded, and Tesla said, we already sucked the data out of it without the owner permissions. Great point. I'm going to come back to that here in a minute. Um, <laughs> did I just wake up your Alexa? All right, here, I want to try this. We'll see. Siri, call mom. I'm waiting to see if anybody's mom got called by Siri. We'll see what happens. Or, okay, Google, call mom on her cell. I don't know. I've always wanted to try that in person. We'll see if it works over the, uh, over the interwebs. So let's move on. That's a lot of data, right? When we talk about trying to keep track of that much data, it's, it's almost unfathomable. Who could possibly store or process or transmit that much data? It's just unfathomable. There's, there's three issues, right, that I mentioned. Storage, we have to store that data somewhere. Do anybody have zip disks? You may remember zip disks. They were fantastic. I love zip disks. I actually found mine not too long ago. I've got a little stack. I'd show them if I was in my office, a little stack of six or seven disks but I don't have anything to read them with. So if anybody still has a working zip drive out there, I'd love to check these disks out and see if, they're, if, if, if there's anything on them. Um, I would imagine, hold on, glad I'm listening to my headphones. Nope, Siri's voice imprinted on me. Darn it, okay. I was hoping maybe somebody would get a call. All right. Uh, <laughs> Austin, I have an inbox zip drive. I do not, uh, yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me. So anyways, storage is one issue. Transmission is another issue. I think I had that exact same modem at one point. Probably half of us on this call had that exact same modem at one point. Um, but the transmission of data is a significant uh, issue that has to be dealt with if we're going to store that much data. And then, of course, there's the processing of data, right? If, if like, that's always been my argument with, with the, uh, I'm not going to say it, I'll say the Echo, unless Echo is your keyword, um, the Amazon device thingy, right? Or whether it's the Google Home or whatever it be. That's always been one of the arguments that I've made is they are not currently doing anything to grab that much data because they don't have the ability to, to process it and transmit it. It would be massive amounts of, 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 uh, of processing and, and storage and transmission to be able to collect the audio of every device indefinitely. Um, now, are they collected more than they should? Or is it turning on more often than it should? Absolutely, we can talk about that at another time. Um, but we, well, let me move on here a little bit. So let's talk about storage. We are really, really, really close to being able to store a nearly infinite amount of data. Um, the, we're not quite there yet. I, I do know like Google, I, I switched my personal domain over to G Suite I don't know, back when it was free, early 2000s. Um, I have never ran out of data on Gmail. Like they just, every time I look at it, it's like, oh, you know, back then it was like, hey, here's a, here's a free 500 megs. And then it's like, you know, you get 750 megs and then it's a gig. And now it's, I don't know, they probably got a petabyte worth of uh, un unread emails in my, in my inbox. But data just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And it's, we're able to store more data in smaller area. We're coming up with more techniques to do it. And so the ability to store data is not necessarily a problem. Just build data center, bigger data centers, right? We got to store it somewhere. Uh, I was actually just talking uh, with Melanie here from StageNet a little bit ago, and we were talking about all of these companies that are decided, you know, because of COVID, you know what? Our people are really productive at home. I don't need to have all these people in an office if, if they're doing really well at home. So maybe we just don't have the added expense of having this office. Somebody, I don't remember who she was talking about, somebody uh, has chosen not to build, they were in the process of finding land to build a new office building to expand. And they realized we don't have to do that. We just, you know, loosen up our work from home policy a little bit. And all of a sudden we save significant amounts of money on, on work from home. So what's going to happen to all of this office space, all this retail space that is really, really cheap because nobody's buying it. Eh, might be a good place for data centers. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe Oklahoma is not the best place to build a data center. It worked for Google. Who knows? Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the best place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Chase says, I've got 15 gigs of mailbox space in Gmail. You're not doing it right, man. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> um, no, I don't know. I've got a lot. I really have no idea how much I have. That's the point. I don't know how much I have. I've never had to look at it. Um, 
anyway, storage is getting cheaper and cheaper. That's the point. So let's talk about transmission. Does anybody know what this is? I hope somebody recognizes this. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait the mandatory four seconds and a billion people are going to post exactly what that is. You are not big enough dorks. I'm going to find a different Techlahoma channel. I know there's someone in Tech Talk that will know what this is. No, a big freaking blade server. That's a good idea. Not quite. Nobody, nobody is typing. I am disappointed in you all. <laughs> Tape robot. This is a Starlink payload. This is 60 satellites. Uh, SpaceX sends these up. Every time they do a launch, they send up this little payload and these 60 little satellites go and then they start breaking up. Um, currently this year, as of like yesterday or the day before when I looked at it, there are 540 of these puppies in orbit. Just over the last year or two, they've put 540 in orbit. Um, if you go, if you Google it, I can't remember where it's at. Uh, there's a, a website where you can say, okay, I want to see the Starlink satellites. And, and you put in your zip code and it'll tell you over the next couple of days where to look and where to see them. And usually at least every night, sometimes a couple times a night, the a group of them, a segment of them will pass over and you can watch them. And, and sometimes they're really faint. Sometimes they're really easy to see it, but it looks like a shooting star going past. And then about three seconds later, another shooting star. And then about three seconds later, and they're, they're spaced out just at a certain pattern. And, and the goal is to basically build this huge grid over the earth that provides potentially gigabit level uh, internet access from anywhere. Yes, they are running some uh, amateur astronomers pictures. It's a sad world. Uh, you know, what, what, what's the little thing? You remember, like, this is the, the smallest violin playing My Heart Bleeds for you? I don't know. No, I, I get it. It is sad. Technology breaks stuff. Technology makes other things better. Personally, for me, I imagine this technology is going to significantly improve our lives in ways that we'll get past some amateur astronomers not being able to take pictures. I mean, heck, the improvements to spaceflight, the ability to send stuff out um, is going to be massive uh, in, in as far as being able to send up telescopes and people being able to take better pictures. So in the future, those uh, amateur astronomers, their ability to take even better pictures is going to be amazing, partly because of this. <laughs> Starlink equals Skynet, exactly. Um, Emily says, uh, satellite latency is sad. You know what? You would think that, but here's the thing. The United States Air Force did a test on a plane. They tested a Starlink connection from satellites to a plane as it was flying over, over the US, they were able to maintain a 610 megabit per second data link. 610 megabit per second. That's significantly faster than my home with my cable connection. Um, and they were able to do it on a plane as they were flying over. So I, we'll see. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, you know how technology is, but the fact is we're getting really, really close to this kind of stuff happening. Their goal is to eventually have, well, the phase one goal is to get 1600 satellites up they have asked for approval to put up to 30,000 satellites in space. So their goal is to, is to be able to, to offer up to gigabit speeds anywhere in the world within the next two years. That's, that's pretty awesome. The other side of that is 5G, right? Now, assuming we all get used to the coronavirus that's being call, caused by 5G, and what was the other thing, Alex Jones? Oh, 5G turns you gay. Like, you know, assuming we all get used to that part of it, 5G cellular technology is going to do amazing things. Uh, depending on the bands, there's different bands that are, are, are um, included in it, but it can provide speeds from up to one to two gigabits per second uh, and down to 25 megabits per second, depending on what you're doing. Um, the thing is though, the infrastructure is uh, capable of, of supporting way more devices than we have right now. Um, way more connections, way more, um, throughput on, on multiple devices. So it will be, it'll be really interesting to see how well this, this works as well. But we're very much getting close to the point where, you know what, my toaster can have its own internet connection with ultra high speed connection, let alone my car or my, um, you know, doorbell or whatever it might be. The point is things are getting much, much, much faster. Processing. Uh, anybody know who this is? I'm waiting. I need the little Jeopardy time. I actually, we talked about getting the Jeopardy song and do, 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 do. The problem is uh, we're playing over YouTube live and we didn't want YouTube to automatically uh, kill us. Uh, Sundar Pechi. Yeah, Ryan's got it. Um, it's not a microwave. It's a quantum computer. That is Google's quantum computer. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, Sycamore. 
this is a 53-bit quantum computer. Um, this, if you guys remember, I think it was about last year sometime, Google put out the thing about quantum supremacy. We've achieved quantum supremacy. All that really means is that in one particular task, they have found a way to, to have a quantum computer um, execute that task in a way, way, in some fashion that's way beyond what a traditional computer could be. Uh, this particular computer was able to execute a particular task in 200 seconds and a traditional computer, uh, a traditional supercomputer, it would have taken it 10,000 years. So 200 seconds versus 10,000 years. This is a long ways from, hey, I've got a, a supercomputer on my desk or a quantum computer on my desk, right? We're not there yet. It's just a proof of concept. But as, as uh, Sundar likes to point out, the first Wright brothers flight only lasted 12 seconds before they crashed. So uh, Dan says in 30 years, we'll have phones. Our phones will have more computing power than a quantum computer. I don't think so. I think the ability to store massive amounts of data in the cloud, the ability to transmit massive amounts of data will mean that our phones do not have to have a significant amount of power. I think they will have enough power to collect the data they need and that the processing will happen elsewhere on a relatively small number of super quantum computers that do just a crazy amount of processing. Um, machine learning a little bit. Uh, this guy, I, I'm guessing nobody knows him unless you just are some crazy South Korean Go fanatic. Uh, this is Lee Sadol. I'm not sure I'm saying that right because I'm not uh, Korean. Um, he is the former South Korean Go champion. And I say he's the former South Korean Go champion because he retired after Google's DeepMind beat him repeatedly. Uh, we've been going back and forth. Go is one of those games that's, that's considered to be, you know, one of the most complicated games on earth and the hardest for, for a, a supercomputer to be able to, to beat a human. But once Google's deep mind machine learning system uh, got to the point that it was just, I mean, it didn't just beat him. It trounced him over and over again. And he basically said, well, I'm done. Like humans cannot go any further in this game. It's a computer game from this point on. Uh, the short version, the combination of processing with machine learning and all that, um, what that comes down to is the massive amounts ability to process things in ways that uh, we just, we can't even comprehend. If we look back 10 years ago, if we look back 20 years ago, we would never imagine where we are today. If we keep going at the same trajectory in five years and 10 years, it's going to be unbelievable. Um, so the, the conversation in Slack a little bit, I, I mentioned that, you know, the, our phones don't have to be a quantum computer because it's going to be processed off. Uh, and, and there's some com conversation going on in Slack uh, about that. That's what we call edge processing. Uh, I'm sorry, that's the opposite of edge processing. So we have two competing ideals, and I don't know how machine learning got in there. Let's pretend machine learning isn't there. That wasn't supposed to be there. We've got two competing ideals. One is we, we gather the data on one place and we ship it off somewhere else for processing. The other is we have all of these devices everywhere. Let's let them process little bits of data and, and then that way that doesn't have to back, uh, happen back at, at the, at the, on the backside. I think we're gonna see a combination of that. We're gonna see all kinds of deeper combina uh, combinations than we imagined. Think about 20 years ago. How many people were building websites 20 years ago, right? Like I remember getting into websites, like my tool was Notepad. I used Notepad and HTML and JavaScript to build my websites. Um, Nowadays, you look at where web development is today and all the technologies and all the stuff, and we have so much client side stuff happening. We have so much server side stuff happening. We still have so much back and forth. We have middleware stuff that's going on that we never would have comprehended. We've got third parties that are interacting. Uh, we grab data from our website and we send it off to a third party and it processes it and sends it back. And then we send that to our server to process and do more things. Like we could not have complicated, we could not have imagined how complex that is the same progression is gonna to continue to happen with um, processing of data on individual devices or in the cloud or whatever. I'm paranoid about being disconnected. I know, I've got a Garmin right here too. Like the, if you guys don't know, Garmin had some kind of attack. I, I didn't hear for sure if it was ransomware, that was the theory, but all of a sudden it's disconnected and you can't, you know, I can't look at my uh, app on my, on my phone and see how many steps I got today or you know, how many calories I burned on that bike ride or whatever it might be. Um, it, it, you get so used to certain things that it really kind of destroys uh, your day when all of a sudden it's not there. So I mentioned, I, I said that there were three issues, right? I said that there was, it was data processing and it was data storage and it was data transmission. And then I mentioned uh, a fourth when I talked about um, the uh, edge processing, but really there's a fifth. There's another issue that we have to think about. Who owns all of this data? Let's go back to the car thing for a little bit. 
who owns the data from a Tesla? Somebody in, in, uh, in the Slack channel mentioned that, uh, what was it, USAA tried to gather the data off of a Tesla and Tesla had already slurped it back up uh, without permission, without ownership. They just, they said, oh, we're gonna take that. Is that their right? Who owns that? I, I, I don't know. Like, d does the driver of the car or the, I mean, if I'm the driver, that data is about me. Is that my personal data? But what if I'm not the owner? What if the owner owns it? Is that the owner's data or the driver's data? Or is it the car manufacturer's data? Is it Tesla? Do they own it? Or Ford or whoever. I'm using Tesla as an example. What about the dealership? What if, what if you go to buy a car and part of the sign off is the dealership retains ownership of the data stream? What if a marketing company says, you know what? I'm going to give you $5,000 towards this car if you sign over the rights to this data stream. How many people are going to do that? All of them, right? I mean, if most likely some of us on here, what if, what if it was more than that? What if it's 50% off? What if somebody came and said for 50, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for half. <laughs> yes, it is a picture from Mr. Robot. Good job. What if somebody come and said, I will pay you half the price of your car of the Tesla if you sign over the rights to the data stream? That's big. I, I, I would think about it. I want a Tesla. I'll be honest. Because <laughs> here's the thing. Only a small portion of that data stream is about me. The vast majority of that data stream is about you all. It's about my neighbors. It's about my coworkers. It's about the people I drive by on the road. So imagine a future. The technology is here, really close to being here. But imagine a future where some marketing company with a little bit of venture capital uh, dollars started going to some folks like Tesla or Ford or Chevy or whoever and said, hey, we will subsidize these cars if you build this API and this technology to be able to ship that data back to us. We will collect the data. We'll make sure it's all legal. We will uh, lobby Congress and, and, and have it passed correctly because we're going to protect it. We're, we're going to keep it private, but we're going to use it as well. Now, just, just think about what that means. Um, and, then, and then you include the other thing, uh, your doorbell feed, your Wi-Fi logs. I'm hesitant to say this. I, I know multiple people that, that, that I've talked to that tell me that the Wi-Fi logs from restaurants and uh, gas stations and hotels and airlines and all of those Wi-Fi logs are purchased by some of these data mining companies that they go through and gather all of that info and keep track. And it's not just necessarily uh, uh, an enterprise grade access point is not necessarily just keeping track of who logged into it, who authenticated to it. It's also potentially keeping track of who walked past it. You're, you're, unless you manually physically turn off the Bluetooth, unless you physically turn off the Wi-Fi, your device is pinging out there all the time. It's sending your MAC address all the time. So there are companies that are buying that data. They are collecting um, maps of where you go and who you interact with and what you do. Even if they can't necessarily uh, coordinate that to you and, and, uh, or correlate that to you and figure out this is who you are, it only takes one application. Look at your phone, flip through the applications. Do you trust every single one of them not to sell that data back to somebody else? Because they all have access to your MAC address. Any one of them could sell that data and correlate it to you back to one of these data mining companies. I guarantee you it's happening. Um, let's talk about data brokers for a second. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go back to this for just one second. Um, I don't want to give too much data. There's a friend of mine that works for a very large university. He recently got to uh, cooperate with a... Um, with law enforcement. Uh, he helped catch a serial rapist, rapist on their campus based on Wi-Fi logs. They keep, the campus keeps Wi-Fi logs of all the buildings for some period of time. And law enforcement was trying to figure out who this could have been, who could have done this, who was in these women's rooms at, at this certain time. And they were able to go back and very easily could dig through the logs and correlate this one particular device was in all of these places at the same time. And, and it was significant enough that uh, the court said, yep, that's good enough for a uh, search warrant. And the results of the search warrant confirmed that, yes, this, this guy was, was guilty. Um, think about what that, I mean, that's great, right? A, a rapist off the streets, absolutely. No, I have no problem with that. But that means they're also capturing that data for everybody else who's not a rapist. They have the ability to track every single person, where they go, who they're with. Um, how many, of, how, how many of you as a student maybe did something or went somewhere that eh, you probably shouldn't have done? What if that data becomes public? What if it's used by somebody that's not uh, maybe as, as appropriate as you would like? Some things to consider. Now imagine that on a larger scale. 
Um, let's talk about data brokers. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Exactus. Um, Exactus is a, was, was, I guess they still are. I'm assuming they're still in business. They're a data broker company that was breached in 2018. Uh, in 2018, they announced they lost the records of 340 million Americans, the full records, tons of data. You can see the examples of some of the, some of the data they collected um, on here. Uh, cross device tracking, ad network, stuff from Nielsen. I don't even know what most of this are. Uh, oh, these are, I'm sorry, this picture, that slides different types of, of data broker companies. But Exactus lost 340 million records. Here's the problem. In 2018, the population of the US was 327 million. They had complete records of literally everybody in the United States. Now, what type of data is included in that? Well, let's look. I don't have exact details for Exactus and what exactly they lost. They said they lost the full records of all those 340 million people. Who knows who has that? But here's another one of those companies. How my slides aren't moving forward. Axiom. Axiom is a, I believe it's a UK based company. Um, but this is just one example. This is part of their marketing material. Um, and did I post the link? No, I didn't post the link on there where I found this. You can Google this and find, uh, find this information fairly easily. This is part of their marketing materials of, of the products they sell. Um, you know, you look over there, age, gender, education, employment, relationship status, number of children, purchases, activities, media usage, loans, income, net worth, vehicles owned. It goes on and on and on. Planning to have a baby, planning to adopt a child, filing taxes in April, uh, in April how likely you are to do those things, what type of home you live in, uh, different types of banking relationships and, and, you know, medical insurance, heavy Facebook user, is it, are they a social influencer, health interests, religion, all these different types of things. Um, it says their documentation, this is directly from their documentation, they provided up to 3,000 attributes and scores on 700 million people in the US, Europe, and other regions. Now, I said before, the population of the US is like, I don't know, it's like 350 million now. So, that's a lot of people. That is a significant number of the population. They have all this data. They sell it. It's all out there. Da, 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 da. Here's another one. Um, I'm going to, oh, let's see if I can do this. This is probably going to go poorly. Uh, all right. This, back when the COVID thing was getting big. Switch, switch. Okay. This video came out. I thought this was really cool. So this person, not this person, this company, put out, they were trying to convince people of how bad the virus was and how easily it spreads and all this. So what they did, this was in March. Yeah. For one week in March, or maybe it was one day, they captured, well, obviously they clearly captured it all, all the time, but they went through and they said, okay, let's look at every mobile device that was connected to a cellular network in Fort Lauderdale on one beach. And so we're going to make, I'll see if I can make this bigger. Hopefully this works. Oh, I don't know if you, are you guys seeing the screen? You guys might not be able to see that. I'm not sure I'm sharing the right screen. Darn it. How much time do I got? 2.30, okay. Hold on. Shoot, you're not gonna be able to see that. Okay. You just see the picture of the map. All right, hold on, we're gonna try this. Stop sharing, share again. How do I share like a whole desktop? Not that one. Yeah, let's try that one. Let's see what happens. Worst case, I share you something I don't mean to, right? Okay, there we go. Let's make this bigger. All right, so they, can you see it now? Looks like a video. Now we're seeing the desktop. Okay, cool. So you'll see this in just a second. Um, all right, so they basically go through and say, okay, we're going to highlight all of the devices that were on, on this one beach on this, at the same time in Fort Lauderdale over spring break. And then they're going to walk through. This is only about another 20 seconds long. What they're going to do is they're going to track all of these devices and see where they go over the next week. And so you can see them start to spread out and start to spread out. And over a week's time, you can see them, how far they go. This is where they went across the entire country. In one week's time, all of the people that were on one Fort Lauderdale beach at one time, that's where they spread out. That was part of the concern that people had when this COVID thing hit. And all of a sudden they said, wow, this could get really bad. People, you know, people go everywhere. Um, now here's the thing, in order to see that, in order for them to be able to track that, they have to be able to track every single cell phone. That's happening. That's available. That is commercial data that is available that uh, people can buy access to. Now, they do say it's anonymized. 
this particular company has anonymized access, but who doesn't have anonymized access to it? Probably a fair number of people. More importantly, when you start tracking those cell phones and you say, huh, this device always goes to that house. Who owns that house? Huh, this person. This device also goes to this place from eight to five every day. Who works at that? Oh, this person, right? It's very easy to de-anonymize that type of thing. Uh, so yeah, Steven said dollar sign. There's a lot of money involved in that. But my point is that level of tracking is already accessible. If you have a device, a mobile device that you carry with you, you are already being tracked. People know exactly where you go, who you spend time with, what you do. All right, let's move on. All right, so like I said, privacy is dead, right? Okay, well, the thing is people don't really want privacy. I mean, that's, that's a proposal. What they, they think they want privacy. They say they want privacy, but what they really want is an illusion of privacy. They want an appearance of privacy. We like the feel of it but we really don't care. Um, that's gonna piss off some people, I get it, but it's true. We don't really want it until it's gone and then we say, okay, now I want this, I wanna do something about it. And what I'm trying to say is we are already there. Um, we have already agreed to sell our privacy for the smallest convenience. Uh, there's been lots of studies on this. A British researcher found that 98% of folks would sign anything in a terms of service, including giving away their first board. Uh, they just kept asking for more and more and more and pretty soon just found out people aren't reading this at all. People would give away whatever they can. We've done that with Facebook, with Alexa. I've already talked about it. I've got those devices. I use Facebook a lot. I'm, I'm not saying I'm innocent necessarily. I'm just saying like, this is an issue. This is the status of where we are. So there's tons of examples of this. I, I wish I had time to go into to more details. Um, I know that tracking sensors for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are used in retail and shopping malls and, and stores. They're on highways. That's how they know how long it takes to get from one point to another point is they actually track users on that highway. Uh, coordinated camera systems. There's 11,000 cameras in Atlanta that are accessible by the uh, police department. These are consumer cameras that people have set up that they've given the police department access so they can view it. Uh, Beijing brags about having 800,000 cameras. Like those numbers are just going to go up. Home automation devices, lots of mobile devices. We talked about that. Facial recognition. I wish I could talk just about facial recognition technology. It is going through the roof. There's a company called Clearview that was demoing a product they have and they were trying to sell it to the New York Police Department. And so they did a demo, they set up a, a sample system and, and they were testing it with the New York Police Department. As part of that, as part of that review process, the police department brought in a reporter to do a story on it and look at it. The system identified the person, knew that it was a reporter, and somebody from Clearview called the New York Police Department immediately and said, whoa, wait, stop, are you talking to the press? This is bad. Like that level of uh, not just facial recognition, but identification is already out there. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Amazon um, not selling their facial recognition system to the government and other systems, stuff like that. Those companies haven't said they're going to stop uh, developing it. They said they're not going to sell it to this particular government that they personally disagree with. That's not going to stop the technology. It's going to continue to develop. I could talk about drones. I could do a whole presentation on drones and some of the privacy things there. Um, it's, it's amazing. Hold on, go back. I was trying to find Slack again. There we are. Okay. Um, some other examples. There's been lots of examples of privacy violations of businesses doing things. Again, I could talk forever. Um, one of the things that I thought was cool, I showed the picture earlier of where I was in the Bahamas. Before I went to the Bahamas, Google Fi, my cell phone provider, knew I was going to the Bahamas. Like I had not told them, I had not searched for the Bahamas on Google Fi, I had not checked anything, but I opened the Fi app because I wanted to know, will I have service in the Bahamas? I have service in like 200 companies or something they tell me, but I wanted to verify before I actually left, would I have service? So I opened up the app and it said, no worries, we'll have you covered in the Bahamas with full support, you know, with full coverage or whatever. Like it knew that, it knew that I was planning a trip because they have access to my email and they have access to probably my searches and everything else. Like on one hand, I'm like, that kind of freaked me out. I'm like, oh my gosh, wow, that's scary. But on the other hand, that's really awesome. Like that was convenient. They saved me. I mean, not a lot of time, but they saved me the time of having to search for that and figure out what's going on and where. Um, I'm going to skip over some of those other examples. There's lots of examples of, of people using this technology in ways that just the average citizen doesn't realize. Um, so some different methods we've done for protecting privacy, things we've tried to pass. We've tried to pass regulations. We've tried to mass data. That's, that's failed. I love the AOL search data. They tried to release anonymized data about your search usage. Um, and then people were able to show, hey, if we do some data mining and analytics, we can actually de-anonymize this data. That, that was a miserable failure. Um, there are companies like LifeLock and others that try to 
to provide notifications of compromise and breach and stuff like that. Um, some different ones have done. Uh, Clear IP provides notification services to businesses. Um, Privion, Privion is, uh, they provide an outsourced chief privacy officer. So th the business world, uh, capitalism is recognizing, hey, here's a concern, let's try to fix it. Let's try to find ways to deal with this. And so far they're not, they don't have a great track record. Things aren't really going great. Um, historically, we haven't had a lot of great examples of, of how we deal with, with uh, limiting technology advances. Uh, revolution has been one, right? Kill off a bunch of people and, and that kind of slows technology. Um, Natural disasters, maybe Atlantis. We don't really know for sure what happened there, but there's all this stuff. Uh, you know, Babylon was another one that, that was had huge amounts of technology. Um, end of the civilization completely, right? The Aztecs, the Incans, the Mayans. Uh, I've got a t-shirt. My campaign shirt for 2020 is Asteroid 2020. Uh, it says something like, you mammals have had your chance or something like that. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, there's also the stick your hand in the, in the, uh, the method. This is probably the, the method most of us use. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'll worry about that when it becomes a problem. I'm, I'm here to tell you it's a problem. We're here. Pull your head out. So here's what's going to happen. Consumers say they want something. They think they want something. And anytime that happens, they're going to be willing to put money into it. And so what is that going to look like when consumers say they want something? Capitalism is going to provide a service. Just a, a brief kind of talk about what that will look like. Um, I, I, I dubbed it privacy as a service because I don't really know. Just like if I went back 10 years ago, I couldn't have began to describe what today's technology world would look like. I can't necessarily tell you what the services in 2020 will, or in 2030 will look like, but I can give you some ideas. First off, there will be some semblance of choice about the control of your data. Who can access it, who can sell it, et cetera. I'm not saying you will have control. I will say you will have some semblance of control over that data. Some appearance of transparency. Here's how we use your data and this is what we do. We already see that nowadays, right? Um, what, are the, what are the little coupons? Uh, uh, if you buy certain groceries from a certain company, you get the, the thing, the barcodes, on, not this barcode, help me out. You get the things that you send in, it gives money for education. My wife collects these, I can't remember what it's called. Box tops, box tops for education. You guys know what I'm talking about? So box tops for education recently changed their process. You no longer have to clip the little things off the label and send it in. Now what you do is you take a picture of your receipt, you set up an account, and they look at your receipt and say, oh, you bought these things from these companies, here's so much money. And they are paying a lot more. We get significantly more money out of our groceries that go to education for that, but they are also collecting records of everything we buy. Every consumer, every school is saying, hey, we can't get enough money from the government, we need our kids to collect these box tops. Everybody that does that is now providing all of this transactional record of the types of items you buy and the companies you buy. So you have this appearance of transparency. They say, well, we only share this with our partners. Who are their partners? I don't know. That's pretty vague uh, uh, legal language. Um, some other ideas, this will be managed by a trusted third party, probably will be subscription based, right? You'll pay a certain amount for you know, regular access or the ability to control this stuff. It, most likely, I kind of expect this to be paid by like insurance companies or, or some other third party. Um, you know, strong security controls. We follow only the best industry uh, you know, security best practices. Um, I, I kind of think this is, will just be a natural product offering by these data brokers. The people that are collecting the money, the, or I'm sorry, the people that are collecting the data and that are selling your data about you will probably be the ones that allow you to pay a certain amount for some semblance of control over that. It rings a little bit like 1984, right? If, you're, if you've read that recently or, or if you haven't, you should. The, the whole concept of, of doublespeak. They had the ministry of love and the ministry of love's job was to torture people. They had the Ministry of Truth, and their job was to, you know, put out propaganda. Um, so, anyways, I know that was a lot. I've rambled for a long time. The short version is privacy is dead. We're there. If you keep saying, you know what, I'll worry about that when it becomes a problem, it's a problem. What are you going to do about it? I'm done. <laughs>